Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Year of Gratitude in Penn State Outreach and Online Education. My name is Rob Butler, and normally at this time of year, I would be welcoming you to our annual Appreciation Dinner, where we show our appreciation for you, the donors and volunteers who help to make possible the important and inspiring work done in outreach and the world campus. At the dinner, it's always a special treat for me to be able to say, welcome to the ballroom of the historic Nittany Lion Inn. Tonight, I welcome you to the guest room in my house. <laughs> We're very pleased to have you join us from wherever you happen to be right now. Our year of gratitude is intended to keep the spirit of the appreciation dinner alive during this very unusual year by providing you with a special event or presentation each month that tells some of the many stories about outreach and online education and how your support has a positive impact on people's lives. We'll be promoting and hosting these monthly events until next October, when we fully intend to be back together with all of you in the ballroom of the historic Nittany Lion Inn. So tonight we have three presentations to share with you. Over the next hour, you'll hear from the leaders of both Outreach and the World Campus, respectively. And then we'll enjoy a talk about Evan Pugh, the first president of Penn State, and the man who defined our land-grant mission, a mission that continues to be realized today through our work in outreach and online education. At the end of the presentations, our speakers will take some of your questions, so feel free at any time to submit questions in the chat box that you can see just to the right of the video screen. To begin tonight, an update on some of the many activities across the outreach portfolio at Penn State, which includes the units within professional and community engagement, the Nittany AI Alliance, and WPSU. I'm very pleased to introduce our Vice President for Outreach, Tracy Houston. Good evening, everyone. And I come to you from Innovation Park this evening. I can't think of a better way to finish the workday than to be able to give thanks and gratitude to all of those folks who have supported us during this time. This evening, I'm going to share with you some of the ways in which our organization has had to pivot in order to continue to serve our constituents. I've had several people ask me, well, now you're a face-to-face -face organization and a high touch outreach unit. How do you flourish in a pandemic. And so this evening, I'm going to share with you some of the ways in which we have done that. So first of all, I want to extend a big thank you from Penn State Outreach. And I wanted to share this quote with you, feeling gratitude and not expressing it is like wrapping a gift and not giving it. And so tonight, I'm going to show you some of the ways in which you and your support have helped us in order to deliver programming at this time. Your support made programming possible at one of the most challenging times in our university's history. And for that, we are grateful. A few highlights from our professional and community engagement portfolio, we had to figure out a way to offer the autism conference, typically to 1600 people face to face. Well, this year we went online with that program and we were able to deliver it to 4,100 people representing 28 states and seven countries. And we were able to make it available at no cost and uh, to all of our educators in the state of Pennsylvania. Our deputy sheriffs were halted in the middle of their program. As you might know, we uh, have a contract with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to serve and train all deputy sheriffs and sheriffs in the Commonwealth. And this was the first group to come back to campus face to face. Uh, they were socially distanced. They all wore masks. Their temperatures were taken twice a day. Uh, they had sanitizer at every seat and they were able to get back at it and uh, graduate on time. We had to think about how we could pivot our, our programs, our summer camps for youth. And uh, so we were able to go online and create virtual camps for students like this one uh, who participated in the high school design program uh, in a face-to-face -face environment, but now is um, participating in a virtual environment. Shavers Creek, uh, the citizen science went global. 
They couldn't come to Shavers Creek. So 86 birder groups from 21 states, uh, Washington, D.C., and four countries participated. And this is one of our participants from uh, Nairobi, Kenya. Our city kids were resilient. They started off in face-to-face -face programming in Pittsburgh, but they ended up, as you can see, uh, graduating with face masks. And uh, these two particular city kids from our spring program are now students at Penn State Greater Allegheny. Our super seniors, we, through our Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, work to uh, train our super seniors on how to use Zoom. And so we were able to connect keep them connected through the beginning of the pandemic and when it was okay to be outdoors and uh, socially distanced. You can see we took them to Shavers Creek and we continue to find ways to deliver programming face-to-face -face in hybrid format and online. In Pittsburgh, our Penn State students started out the semester working in the city of Hazelwood on uh, sustainable issues with the local community. And this is how our Penn State students in the semester uh, in uh, Pittsburgh ended the year. But you can also see that they had meaningful work to do in a virtual setting and that they were deeply appreciated by the sponsors of the program in the city. Also in Philadelphia, students like Bianca seen here and Ashish worked with Professor uh, Wadia on creating materials for those immigrants in the city of Philadelphia who were hit hard with the COVID virus and providing them with the resources needed to uh, focus on wellness and um, ways to uh, address the COVID-19 um, epidemic in their populations. Moving on to the Nittany AI Alliance, we have had continued corporate support for which I am deeply grateful for our student engagement from organizations like this, as well as software and technology companies that you can see listed here. This is one of our Nittany AI student groups, and they are working on increasing literacy rates in Africa. And they uh, started out here at University Park face-to-face. -face. They went online virtually using Zoom like we are this evening. They launched their first uh, camp in Kenya, the first pilot boot camp in Kenya in August. And here are two of the students who participated in that. And as you can see, we've uh, had a program manager reach out from one of the technical schools there and say that they would like to partner with us on this product to bring literacy to uh, young students like this. Additionally, we were able to use AI to reshape transportation. These are the two students who worked with the Office of Innovation in the city of Philadelphia over the summer to think about how they could reshape transportation during uh, the pandemic. And our students were recipients of funding from the National Science Foundation, and they were also invited to participate in national conferences uh, discussing their product and refining it based on the expertise with whom they could engage at the conferences. Moving to WPSU, um, as you know, we were an essential industry. And so we were able to tap the expertise of the best and brightest of our faculty and practitioners around epidemiology, public health, uh, and infectious diseases to deliver content through Take Note, through television conversations live where members of our community and viewing audience could call in and have the opportunity to engage with some uh, of our uh, faculty who are content experts in these areas. Of course, we're also uh, about to have an election. And so our Democracy Works initiative uh, was quite successful in bringing some of the uh, speakers, not only from Penn State, but from across the country to talk about uh, democracy and civic engagement. Uh, we were able to deliver programming around social justice, tapping our faculty as well as faculty from across the country for WPSU in both radio and television format. Uh, we have 105 school districts in our WPSU viewing area. And so we quickly pivoted to be able to provide educational content that um, was endorsed by the Pennsylvania Department of of education to support students and educators at home. This is our Eberly College of Science multi-platform uh, program that we deliver not only uh, 
through broadcast and through our PBS affiliate stations across the country, but also um, as part of our work uh, in a digital platform setting. We were able to deliver online courses uh, and develop three-part COVID MOOC courses with our faculty here at Penn State that was relevant and accessible at no cost to our audiences nationwide. We also uh, produced the national documentary and there you can see the producer, director and writer for Speaking Grief. At the time when we set out to create this national documentary, uh, we didn't realize what would transpire in our country and world. Uh, and it continues to be leveraged every day to help people with their grief. Uh, we were funded by the New York Life Foundation. 160 public television stations have aired it nationwide. We've been in 46 of 50 media markets and we provided as part of our uh, online social media platform 24 seven crisis support uh, when we were airing the national documentary online. And this is just one quote uh, from somebody who uh, was impacted by our work. As I said, we were an essential industry, so our staff had to find creative ways to do their work while being safe and socially distanced, but still deliver the news. Also, we provided support to the university and we'll be uh, standing up our third commencement uh, at the end of this semester. In the spring, we had 92,000 viewers from 121 countries log on to watch our commencement program. And these are just some scenes from behind the scenes. You can see how we were able to deliver the programming and keep everybody safe. We've also delivered social justice uh, programming in support of the Office of the President and the Vice Provost for Educational Equity. We were able to deliver to all of our alumni and friends live star studded art celebration at the same time giving our College of Arts and Architecture students the opportunity to do their senior performance virtually. We were able to support uh, the welcoming and retention of the class of 2024 with strategic communications and undergraduate education by being the infrastructure at WPSU for the delivery of programming of that nature. And by the way, we won two Emmy Awards. Uh, we actually competed against the Philadelphia 76ers, the Pittsburgh Penguins, and the University of Pittsburgh. And I'm proud to say that both uh, Unrivaled, the football story, and the Penn State basketball story won Mid-Atlantic Emmy Awards. Speaking of awards, I would like to end by thanking the Philanthropist of the Year. Uh, Penn State's 2020 Philanthropist of the Year is Keiko Mia Ross. She is a major donor to WPSU and has provided significant contributions to other parts of the university. And I wanted to give the opportunity to share with you um, the uh, wonderful support that she has provided to us at WPSU and express gratitude to her and express my great gratitude uh, to all of you and to thank the production team this evening who are helping us to do this, as well as our special guest, Roger Williams. So on behalf of Penn State Outreach, please know we are busy and we are grateful for the support that you give us in this most challenging time. With that, back to you, Rob. Thank you, Tracy. I, I have worked here for a long time and, and even I still get impressed by <laughs> how much our organization does in, in a given year. It's quite remarkable. Thank you. So our next speaker is one of the people the university turned to for guidance last spring when it became clear that in-person instruction would need to transition to online instruction. I have the pleasure of introducing our Vice Provost for Online Education at Penn State, Dr. Renata Engel. Good evening, and it's really a pleasure to be with you here tonight. Um, although this is an unusual format, uh, certainly seems vastly different from our usual events, there is one constant. It is our purpose uh, to express our deep appreciation for all that you have done and are doing to support our work. The background you see behind me, the virtual background includes images of our students and our alumni, our staff, really it's our World Campus family. And they're joining me virtually in this image uh, to thank you tonight. 
Now, ever since its beginning 22 years ago, uh, Penn State's World Campus has provided the path for students to learn relevant and rich content from knowledgeable faculty and certainly all while engaging with their peers and in a virtual environment. So from those rather humble beginnings uh, over 22 years ago, we had only four programs, 10 faculty and 44 students. We are now providing more than 20,000 students annually access to more than 200 undergraduate and graduate programs. So in addition to expanding that academic support content over those 20 years, we've added academic support, bridge programs, access to career services, opportunities for leadership development, and I would say even structured approaches so that our learners can build networks, both social and professional, uh, through student organizations. And while the flexibility that's afforded by the online environment continues to be a significant driver for our students, we are also seeing more students seek co-curricular opportunities. And so we've responded. And as a result, uh, we've developed some unique program opportunities for embedded study abroad experiences. This would have been unheard of over 20 years ago. But our labor and employment relations program for the past three years has taken 20 to 30 students each year to study labor practices in other countries. And so far they've studied in Ireland, Scotland, and Croatia. We've also been promoting virtual internships and boy, hasn't that come in handy recently. Companies, including the federal government have provided opportunities for our students who are location bound to have embedded work experiences and apply what they are learning as they continue their studies. And we're really appreciative of that kind of support from them. And finally, I would say we've created some fantastic leadership opportunities for our students. In fact, earlier this week, we hosted a professional conference for World Campus students to develop leadership skills. We had over more than 300 students registered for the program and they attended seminars and workshops. There were motivational speakers and our students engaged and were really challenged by the opportunity to develop their leadership skills. Uh, these things will really help augment their degree program. So we find these things to be incredibly valuable for our students. So while our program has evolved over the years, our student population continues to be dominated by the adult learner. The average age of our undergraduate students is 32 and the average age for our graduate students is 35. But we're seeing teenagers uh, in our classes and we're also um, having 72 year olds uh, graduate with associate's degrees. So it's pretty impressive to see the range of students. Of course, we continue to have a very strong support for our military learners with about 20% of our students coming from the military or being a military spouse or having served in the military. Most of our students, as I think many of you know, come to us because life circumstances got in the way of their pursuit of a college education earlier in their lives. Some joined the military right out of high school uh, and are now uh, pursuing their education. Others actually are finding a passion in something and they want to uh, earn a degree to pursue that passion. Some are looking for a career change, perhaps uh, a new a, a career, uh, maybe with a first degree or an additional degree. But as we support them in their educational experience, what I'd really like to talk about for the next several minutes is what you are doing to contribute uh, to this, their achievement of their dreams through your generosity uh, that they are achieving their dreams. And how do I know this? You know, I do because they tell us, they write us letters, they tell us in videos, uh, they contact us and talk to us when we held events. And what they're doing is they're thanking us and they're thanking you. And I'd like to spend the next several minutes really telling you more about what we are hearing from them. I thought I'd begin first by telling you about what you are doing when you're supporting them. You are actually helping to create the next generation in so many fields. Educators, doctors, lawyers, accountants, engineers, entrepreneurs, healthcare professionals, nurses, screenwriters, journalists, R&D technologists, psychologists, childhood development specialists, marketers, and so on and the list does go on. You know, but more than helping them complete their degree, you are helping them become what they aspire to be. I share with you some now, now some of their aspirations, and I've selected these from 
the stories they've told us. So these are excerpts, they're phrases from some of their letters and from a, some of their notes to us. And they're conveying their aspirations. Here's what they're saying. I wanna serve as a justice in the International Council of Justice in The Hague. I wanna build a program for others to overcome addiction and live a joyful, vibrant life. I want to set an example for my children. I want to fill a void in rural communities with much needed support to families. I want to help guide young people. I wanna make a bigger impact in our country. I want to provide children who are at risk you know, the guidance they need to be successful. I wanna start my own business. I want to help others realize their dreams. When I read these aspirations, I cannot think, help think about them, you know, the work that you are doing, the ripple effect that starts with your generosity. You really are amazing in starting that effect. And you may know the student's name and you may have received a letter of gratitude from them, but you may never know all of the individuals that they are impacting or the communities that they're touching, they're building and they're sustaining. Your generous support is going well beyond them. It has enabled them to reach their goals and impact others. And that is tremendous. Thank you. And as I extend my appreciation to those of you that are joining us here this evening, I also want to mention the breadth of support that comes from a wide variety of donors, a variety of people across really all of segments that touch World Campus. You know, in some cases, it's people whose life work has put them in touch with adult learners. And because of that, connection that they might have made with an adult learner, they want to help other adult learners. They want to help them start on a path that's very strong. They want to help them get across the stage. We had a donor who supported military learners because he wanted to say thank you to them for serving our nation. We have staff who contribute monthly in payroll deduction. Because they see how hard our students are working to get to us, they want to help them with a bit of financial support that they can provide. We have recent graduates who very quickly turn around and contribute to a student fund to help follow those close behind them. We have other amazing donors who provide lead gifts. Those lead gifts inspire others. They set the stage for others to contribute. Really, we have the benefit of each of you helping us help our students. And for that, we are tremendously grateful. And as I wrap up my comments here, I thought you might like to hear how our students say thank you and what they think about your generosity. So I'm gonna now share some very specific quotes from the students uh, that send notes to us. And when they're sending these notes, they're thanking you. And here's what they say. They say, you are an outstanding example of what I hope to achieve someday in my business, career, and philanthropic endeavors. I promise that I will pay it forward to others. Your contribution just isn't helping me, it's helping other single mamas out there. Thank you for believing in me. I will be able to repay your kindness to another veteran. I will do my best to honor you. You have opened a door and provided this opportunity for not only me, but a Native American and a rural community. It is people like you that inspire us to never give up. And finally, this from one of our students. The best way I can show my gratitude is by seeing this journey through and creating a positive change that I can bring. I intend to use my education to help my community to continue to be strong and vibrant. My goals and dreams sometimes seem big, lofty, idealistic, and may be out of reach. However, when support such as yours reaches me and lifts me up just that extra bit, my goals and dreams feel that much closer. Pretty powerful. Thank you. I join that student in saying that you lift us up. Thank you for your generosity and support of our incredibly talented and inspirational learners. They really do make all of us Penn State proud. Thank you. And back to you, Rob. Thank you, Renata. That was terrific. The students always make me very inspired as well. Um, just as a reminder to everybody that uh, if you have a question for one of our speakers, uh, you can enter it into the chat box on the screen there. And we're gonna ask your questions of all the speakers uh, at the end of our, our final presentation. 
Uh, but just one very quick note. Thanks very much. We uh, do have one comment from uh, Melinda. Thank you, Melinda. I uh, just want to say congrats on being able to provide opportunities for students and communities during this very difficult time. And we really appreciate that support. So our featured speaker this evening is just about as true blue and white as they come. Dr. Roger Williams earned his bachelor's, master's, and a doctoral degrees from Penn State. He retired in 2015 as Executive Director of the Penn State Alumni Association and Affiliate Associate Professor of Higher Education. Roger is a historian and an author who writes about Penn State and land-grant college history. His third book, to be titled Frederick Watts and the Founding of Penn State, will be published next spring by Penn State University Press, which also published his first two books. George W. Atherton and the Origins of Federal Support for Higher Education, and the book on which this evening's presentation is based, Evan Pugh's Penn State, America's Model Agricultural College. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to introduce to you Dr. Roger Williams. Roger, thank you for being with us tonight. It's great to be with you tonight and uh, great to salute our donors to Penn State Outreach and Online Education. Uh, just as outreach and online education are contending with a global pandemic, and in fact doing very well in the face of that challenge, Penn State has always been through a number of challenges in its history, very profound challenges. And what I'd like to do tonight is to take you back in time, more than a century and a half, and tell you something about our origin story, which focuses on the man you see in front of you, Evan Pugh, our founding president. He's a Pennsylvanian, he obtained an advanced scientific education in Europe, and he came back here to serve as our president from 1859 to 64. He was here for only four and a half years, but what he accomplished in that time is truly extraordinary. In fact, I like to call him a visionary with a driving sense of purpose. And we're gonna to move to the next screen. Here we go. There we go. Many of you Penn Staters will know that, uh, will remember that Joe Paterno had his grand experiment. Well, Evan Pugh had what he called his great experiment. And basically that consisted of building the nation's first successful agricultural college. And he built it on the highest scientific standards of the day. He secured the land grant designation for us, which of course continues to define us to this day. But he had a national influence as well. He influenced the development of agricultural colleges nationwide, research stations, federal agencies, and other practices to advance agriculture. And before he died shortly, he developed a visionary plan, the first visionary plan for American land grant colleges. Who was he? Well, he was born in 1828. That's 192 years ago in Oxford, which is uh, in the Southwest corner of Chester County, as you see there on a farm, on this farm, although these buildings uh, are not original to the Pew Farm. However, on the left, you see the stone that was the threshold of his home in Oxford, Chester County. Who was he? Well, he was sixth generation Welsh Quaker from a family of farmers and blacksmiths. His great, great, great grandfather, Ellis Pew, came over here about a year or two after William Penn founded Pennsylvania in 1682. So he grew up on a farm. His father, who was a blacksmith and a farmer, was blinded in an accident when Pew was only two years old. And his father lived for about 10 more years and died in 1840 when Pew went to live with his grandfather. Uh, and you see the home, which was literally across the road, where he was taught by his aunt Adriana, a very well-educated Quaker woman. Pew's youth, as you can see here, he's a kind of a loner, he's reflective, he's, he's melancholy, he grows up on the farm. He apprentices as a blacksmith for about two years. He hates it, it's an utter waste of time. He leaves for a seminary in upper upstate New York, returns to Chester County in 1848 and teaches school across the border. And in 1849, he opens his own school, the Jordan Bank Academy, which was oriented towards science, very unusual for the day and very successful. Pew also works 
as a journalist during this time. He covers meetings, trials, he writes human interest features, and uh, he continues this practice when he goes to Germany. He sends lengthy descriptive letters describing life in Germany and German universities back to newspapers in the United States. In 1852, Pugh covered Pennsylvania's first women's rights convention, which was held in Westchester. And you can kind of see what his philosophy is. Uh, the question of uh, women's rights affects the whole human race. We know from sad experience that women cannot rise, well, that man cannot rise while woman is degraded. So in the Quaker tradition, he is quite uh, an egalitarian and a believer in gender equality. He also comes under the influence of this gentleman, William Darlington, a physician, a politician, a banker, and who goes on to fame as one of America's leading botanists. Uh, he has a great interest in agriculture and agricultural science, and he takes Pew under his wing, and he encourages young Evan to go to Europe for advanced scientific study. Now, keep in mind, in the 1850s, there was no graduate study per se in American colleges. If you wanted to really learn the science of agriculture, such as it was, you had to travel across the pond. Well, Pew leaves for Germany, and he has an agenda. He knows exactly what he wants to do. He wants to fit himself as a scientist so that he can lead and in fact create a scientifically based agricultural college. He goes first to study at Leipzig University. And there he meets Samuel Johnson, also a young man, and they really hit it off. Johnson has just graduated from Yale in chemistry. And he goes on, he will long outlive Pew, and he will become known as the leading agricultural scientist of the day. Uh, Pew and Johnson form a very tight relationship and they exchange letters over the course of the rest of Pew's life. And uh, with Johnson, Pew could let his hair down. Uh, let's see if I can go back here a second. Pew goes on to the University of Göttingen. He studies with uh, one of the fathers of organic chemistry, Friedrich Wohler, and he earns his PhD. Very unusual for the day. Only a handful of Americans are studying science in German universities at this time. Pew dedicates his uh, dissertation, you see it here, to Dr. Darlington back in Chester County. And although not required, uh, Pew took oral exams in chemistry and physics in German, and he passed summa cum laude. He then leaves after obtaining his PhD to go to Heidelberg to study with this gentleman, Robert Bunsen, whose name should be familiar to many of you. However, Bunsen was extremely popular. Pew could not get into his class. So he teamed up with some other faculty members and went on bot bot uh, botanical tours. He happened uh, upon an estate sale in Heidelberg in the summer of 1856, and he bought uh, the uh, uh, herbarium that was now in, that was in existence as part of this estate. And he brought it back across the waters to uh, Pennsylvania. And actually this herbarium is in existence and the specimens are in pretty good shape. Um, they're housed in the bottom, the bottom of uh, Whitmore Laboratory. In Harrisburg, he becomes intrigued with one of the raging scientific controversies of the day. Uh, two French chemists are trying to figure out how plants uh, graminaceous plants in particular assimilate nitrogen. As you know, nitrogen is about two thirds of the atmosphere. It's an essential nu nutrient for uh, plant life. And the basic research question was, well, how in heck do plants assimilate nitrogen? Uh, do they do it through the air or through the soil? So, well, to arrive at a conclusion, Pew leaves for England to become part of the Rodhamstead Experiment Station, which is possibly the most uh, famous agricultural research facility in the world. And uh, the two gentlemen who run the place are deeply interested in Pew's research, and so they set him up. And so over the next 16 months, Pew basically engages in a very elaborate and transparent research project. He invites scientists to come in from Europe and even America to take a look at what he's doing. And the method to his madness was to make sure that when he announced his findings, it would be accepted without controversy, and it was. Pew settles the question that plants assimilate nitrogen through the soil. One of the faculty members of Penn State said that if research of such significance were published today, the author would likely get a Nobel Prize. 
Pew's research, in fact, forms the foundation, the very foundation for the modern ammonium nitrate fertilizer industry. And it gets Pew elected as a fellow of the London Chemical Society. This is a big deal. Uh, as chemists such as Michael Faraday and others uh, were elected to this elite group. And at the bottom, what you see is a, a poster, if you will, of Pew's experiment. So we're going to put Pew aside briefly. We're going to keep him parked in England, where he is the toast of that island nation, as one of the rising young scientists in the Western world. And in this country, what's going on is that the agricultural movement, the agricultural college movement, rather, is getting ahead of steam in the early 1850s. And it's going to morph into the land-grant college movement. But I want to give you a sense of what the forces underlying this uh, particular movement were. But first, let me set the stage. American higher education in the decade before the Civil War. Well, you have about 220 colleges. Most of them are private. They're denominational, which is to say they're sponsored by uh, a denomination, whether they're Lutheran or Presbyterian or Methodist. Typically, they're led by a minister. And uh, of the colleges founded uh, before the Civil War, the 40 years before the Civil War, only 10 of them were public in the sense that we understand the word. And uh, certainly the Farmers High School, the Agricultural College of Pennsylvania would be construed as public. Most of the colleges looked backwards rather than forwards. They were oriented toward literary studies, especially the study of Greek and Latin, rhetoric, so on and so forth. They were small. The average enrollment, maybe 75 students. Faculties ranged to about four to six faculty members. Uh, if you were lucky, you had a scientist, but the scientists were basically isolated one from another. They were constrained by the, uh, the burdens of uh, teaching and uh, student discipline. And they really did not have the apparatus or the critical mass of colleagues to really advance science in any profound way. So what's behind what becomes the agricultural college land grant college movement? The democratic impulse especially after the election of Andrew Jackson in 1828, which ushers in the so-called age of the common man. Uh, basically, the idea is to make American society more responsive to the common man, uh, to make a college education uh, accessible to the industrial classes. Well, who are they? Well, basically, about 80 to 90% of the uh, adult population were in the industrial classes. These were people who worked with their hands. So mechanics, laborers, tradesmen, and especially farmers. During this decade, keep in mind, we were still essentially a rural country. 84% uh, lived in rural areas in 1850 and most were engaged in farming. And one of the problems, especially in the Northeast, in New England and into the middle Atlantic states was soil exhaustion. And the thinking was, how do we mediate those soils such that they don't exhaust themselves and so that we can continue to make them productive Another force, utilitarianism, if you will. Uh, America is an eminently practical society. And the idea was to make education more practical and less classical, especially uh, relevant to the emerging industrial economy, which really comes into full flower after the Civil War. But the central ingredient behind this is the rise of science. This is the fundamental force driving Western civilization, in fact, in Europe and even in America, although America was lagging far behind Europe before the Civil War. And so the idea is how do we make higher education a little more accommodating to science and technology, and especially in the applied subjects of agriculture and engineering. One of the organizations behind this movement were the state agricultural societies. And in Pennsylvania, our state agricultural society was founded in 1851. And it was presided over by this gentleman, Frederick Watts, who is the founding president. He's from Carlisle in Cumberland County. He's an attorney by profession, a judge, a businessman, a gentleman farmer. He's the president of the Cumberland Valley Railroad for 42 years. But his main interest in life is agricultural reform. And so as president of the State Agricultural Society, he's pushing with his colleagues, the Pennsylvania legislature to set up an agricultural college. And here is the business plan that Watts contrived uh, in a letter he sent to the governor of the, of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania at the time, William Bigler. Uh, he says, we're gonna, we're gonna need $38,000 to get this place up and running. And of that, $20,000 should come in the form of a state appropriation. 
Uh, the operating costs were pegged at about half that, $16,000 a year. And as you can see, the majority, $15,000, uh, was to come from uh, tuition revenue. That was the plan. Actually, the Farmers High School the institution that we now know as the Pennsylvania State University was chartered in 1854, not 1855, but the original charter called for 65 trustees. 65, imagine how difficult it would be to get them together, and it was. And so uh, the, that charter was revoked and a new charter signed by Governor Pollock, specifying only 13 trustees was signed on February 22nd, 1855. That is the uh, date of Penn State's birth. So in 1859, the trustees are enticing Evan Pugh to accept the presidency of the Farmers High School. And they don't really have to entice him. He wants to do this. His goal, very explicitly, was to develop upon the soil of Pennsylvania the best agricultural college in the world for the agriculture student of America. You see Pugh's salary. Uh, you see the building as Pugh saw it. This is the, what was called the college building, um, about a third of the way finished when he arrived on campus in October of 1859, a faculty of five. And as you can imagine, Pew did just about everything, including uh, refining the curriculum to one of scientific rigor. He forms a close relationship with uh, the local trustee, who is Hugh McAllister, who lives in Belfont. And, uh, Hugh McAllister plays a, a very important role in helping to get this institution up and running. One of the original historians of Penn State said there was scarcely a day which did not have some task for the college which demanded his thought and counsel and some of his money as well. So Pew is here in the fall of 1859, transitioning into the uh, winter of 1860. And his first job is to set expectations and rules for students. He really wants them to uh, pay attention. He does not have much tolerance for student misbehavior and there was plenty of it, but Pew was uh, uh, a disciplinarian. He knew how to work with boys and most of the students were boys of 16 and 17 years of age in this early time. But he also appeals to the students better angels, if you will, the better angels of their nature. He's saying the whole nation is watching us they're watching this great experiment and we cannot let it fail. Uh, we owe it to the cause of agricultural practice. We owe it to the agriculturalist himself and to ourselves. We are here to show upon the soil of Pennsylvania for the first time in the world that the idea of study and labor as proposed here is practicable. This is an idea of what the full course was, just the second year and the fourth year. You can see some of the subjects, heavily scientific, mathematical in nature, and it was a lockstep curriculum. There were no electives. This is what every student took. Pew also went on the road in the, the fall of 1860, and he spoke to the Cumberland County Agricultural Society and published his speech into a 39 page booklet, which was sent across the country. Uh, what science has done and may do for agriculture. He says, we're lagging far behind Europe and Great Britain. And so he's arguing for a national system of agricultural science and education provided by American agricultural colleges with the farmer's high school as the model. So he set the rules and regulations for students in 18, by 1860. He's reorganized the curriculum into the full course. He's laid out a grand plan. And most importantly, he wins the confidence of trustees. Frederick Watts says he is young, energetic, and writes as if he has devoted himself to the, to the object of building the institution up into fame. Now, Pew is not making this up as he goes along. He has a set of guiding principles for building a successful agricultural college. First of all, he doesn't want these places to be second or third tier institutions. They have to be of the highest academic quality in the country. They must stand in the same relation to agriculture that our highest military academies stand to the art and science of war. They have to be research institutions. Uh, they have to, faculty have to be researchers as well as teachers, especially important because the agro the agricultural sciences were not well formed at this time. You had to invent the discipline, if you will. And the same was true of engineering. He's saying these places, these agricultural colleges have to be large. They can't be small. P 
Pew wanted 400 to 800 students. Uh, he wants the school to be efficient and he's saying a small agricultural college, a small scientific institution cannot succeed. It has to have a critical mass. They also need to be independent. They can't be attached as a subdivision of a literary or liberal arts college. The literary college will sap its vitality, he said, rob it of its enthusiasm, take away its best students, and finally appropriate its means of subsistence. And an agricultural college has to be led by a scientist as opposed to a minister or a classically educated president because only a scientist will know how to spend money appropriately to get these institutions moving in the right direction. So it's 1861, the nation is just on the brink of the outbreak of the Civil War in April of that year, but uh, Pew is continuing to build this place, this farmer's high school, but he has to get the building done. Everything hinges on it. And so he takes this photograph that you see here. He takes it to the legislature and he is able to finagle an appropriation of nearly $50,000 to get the building finished. Now, this is a building. It was called the College Building, not Old Main. And uh, it was designed with 165 dorm rooms, which would accommodate 330 students. That's a lot of students for the day. And this college was dependent on tuition. In um, the first two years, tuition provided about, well, almost 90% of the budget. So we want to get the building built. We want to get students here. 1861 ends on a triumphant note, the first graduating class, the first bachelor of scientific agriculture degrees in this country went to these 11 young men that you see here. Uh, it was a tough curriculum. Only 20% of the students who uh, started this curriculum graduated and they are before you. They were required to complete a dissertation. Uh, here are some of the topics. This was kind of the senior uh, thesis project. And so 1861 ends uh, on this note. Uh, the college building is uh, beginning to rise. Uh, the first graduates are there. The curriculum is diversified a bit. And uh, graduate study leading to the master of scientific agriculture is introduced as well. Just a moment to talk about Pew's standing as a scientist. This really was one of the brightest and most respected young scientists uh, in America. You knew that he was elected a fellow of the London Chemical Society. Uh, he presents experiments and is regarded as one of the leading members of the uh, newly formed uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science. In 1861, he was asked by the US Bureau of Agriculture to draft a report on American agricultural colleges, the few of them that were trying to get up and running. Uh, and then a year later, he was invited to advise the Bureau on how it should transition to become a, an independent agency as the US Department of Agriculture. That same year, he was elected to the American Philosophical Society. No small, uh, no mean feat. This was uh, an organization that was started by Benjamin Franklin back in the 18th century. But this is, uh, the essence of Evan Pugh. If there's only one slide I want you to try to remember, it is this one. Pugh was twice offered the post of chief chemist of the United States, of the US Department of Agriculture, but he refused it. And here's what he said. Uh, he refused to accept the head of that department. Uh, it was offered to me two years ago because I wanted to vote myself to agricultural education. The best way to do this, I conceive, is to make our own college a model which other agricultural colleges will adopt. To do this, I am resolved to stay with our college. It is my duty and my destiny to do so, and I shall seek honors in the path of duty and destiny rather than at Washington. So this was a man on a mission. And again, this grand plan that he proposes for American agriculture, it places the model agricultural college, which he was trying to build at the apex of the system. He wants additional agricultural colleges. He wants agricultural experiment stations across the nation. And he wants to see the US Federal Department, the US Department of Agriculture, brand new in 1862, become as effective as possible. There were some other false starts at agricultural colleges, as you can see here. Uh, most of them uh, foundered early on and others were chartered, but they really could not get uh, up and running before the Civil War. The two that did get uh, up and running were uh, in Michigan and in Pennsylvania. 
And there was always some uh, controversy as to uh, which was the first or the most successful. Well, both started about the same time in February of 1855. Uh, the Michigan Agricultural College, which is now Michigan State, uh, opens first. Uh, we opened in 1859, a year and a half later. Uh, Michigan's founding president was, of all things, a newspaper editor who resigned after two years. Well, our founding president was a scientist of renown who stayed until his death. One of the weird things about the Michigan Agricultural Colleges is that most students who were enrolled there opted for the classical curriculum, the one centered on Greek and Latin. Um, in fact, one faculty member said there is probably not one young man that has come here for the sole purpose of studying the science of agriculture. Uh, kind of hard to believe. At the Farmers High School, we offered the true scientific curriculum. And uh, although Michigan uh, was able to graduate seven students about a month before we did, we graduated the first to hold the Bachelor of Scientific, Agri Bachelors of Scientific Agriculture degree in this country. And during the Civil War, now consider that uh, this is a time when the war is draining manpower and money prodigiously. But as you can see in the middle column, you can see the growth over the course of the Civil War growing from 88 to 122. Uh, Michigan was kind of uh, stagnant in terms of enrollment. But the point is we have three state-sponsored agricultural colleges in operation before the Civil War. In Michigan, in Pennsylvania, and in Maryland. Although in Maryland, uh, the school was functioning more as an aristocratic college. It was founded by the planter class, if you will, and really wasn't uh, uh, nearly on the level of the Farmers High School, which was dedicated to scientific agriculture and far and away was the most successful of the three. So we're up to 1862, enrollment is growing. Uh, the name has changed to the Agricultural College of Pennsylvania and the Morrill Land Grant College Act is passed in Congress and Pew issues a college catalog, which is a masterpiece, uh, really the coming out uh, publication of the institution. And he's saying the college is full, notwithstanding the disturbed state of the country and all of its affairs are working more satisfactorily than they have ever done before. And in December of 1862, 15 more students graduate. That's the largest class until 1890. What is the Morrill Land Grant College Act? Basically, it's an act passed by Congress, and the point was to award to the states, based on their population, uh, federal territory, federal land in the states and territories to the west. The idea was to sell the land and to use the proceeds to set up an endowment, an endowment to support at least one college whose purpose would be, and this is the Act's language, without excluding other scientific and classical studies, and including military tactics to teach such branches of learning as are related to agriculture and the mechanic arts. In order to promote the liberal and practical education of the industrial classes in the several pursuits and professions of life. So, under Pew's direction, he is the puppet master, uh, the Pennsylvania agricultural community is lobbying hard and fast to get this act passed through Congress. And one of the members of the Board of Trustees is this gentleman, James Tracy Hale, who is in Congress and is pushing very, very hard to make sure that Justin Morrill's act gets through. Pew is praised for leadership in the campaign to pass the Morrill Act. In fact, he's the only scientist who's advocating for this. And you can see what the original land grant historian said back in 1942. Evan Pugh led the Pennsylvania group with characteristic zeal and with effective, if not determining influence on the final result. Well, it's one thing to have this piece of legislation passed on the federal level, but the act required that the state had to accept its terms through an act of legislature. And so Pugh and Hale are pushing in Harrisburg to make sure the state legislature passes uh, their acceptance act, which it does. And you can see embedded on the portico of Old Main is the language from that act and the faith of the state is hereby pledged to carry the same into effect. 1862, well, the college building is uh, being constructed. They have a new contractor and the hope is to get it up by, uh, completed by November, 1862. That's not gonna happen. There's also a new president's house uh, that is beginning. Uh, this is the plan. You see Pew's uh, drawing uh, on the left and you see the house as it was completed after Pew's death. He never got to live in it, 
Uh, he helped to finance it. He basically said, uh, I'll pay for about a third of it if the trustees will pay the rest. And in 1862, this college catalog uh, comes out. Again, this is a, a masterpiece and in it is the origins of Penn State's mission of the, of the, of the current era. Uh, he wanted an, an educational institution offering the, the full range of the natural sciences with agriculture as the priority. This was to be a practical uh, and applied institution, if you will. It was to be a research institution, uh, especially focusing on experimentation in agricultural science. And it was to be a servant of the state. This is the, uh, the service, the outreach mission, if you will, protecting the industrial interests of the state and most especially the agricultural interest. 1863 high tide for Pew into college. In January, the first graduate degree was awarded the Master of Scientific Agriculture. Enrollment increases 29% to 142. Pew says this is a larger number that have been during the same time in attendance upon any other agricultural college in this country or in Europe. There are 11 graduate students in attendance. And of course, in April of that year, the legislature accepts the terms of the Morrill Act and designates the Agricultural College as the sole recipient. But then things begin to unravel. And we'll talk about that. So in June, a terrible buggy accident, Pew and his fiance are visiting uh, Pew's cousin in this home in Belfont. Uh, after they're done, it's a dark night and uh, the horse and buggy are thrown into the stream in front of this. Um, Pew's arm is badly broken and Rebecca is pinned underneath, but he manages somehow to pull her from the wreck and save her from drowning. Pew is uh, badly injured. He's gonna stay at his desk. Uh, I don't know what horse doctor was attending to him in central Pennsylvania, but after uh, this battle, uh, he will leave for Philadelphia to uh, uh, seek help at the uh, University of Pennsylvania Hospital. But uh, as if the buddy, buggy accident weren't enough, you have the Army of Northern Virginia invading the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And you all know that that culminates in the Battle of Gettysburg in early July. It is a Union victory. Uh, the Reb Army is kicked out of the Keystone State. And uh, a lot of the students leave the college. It does not shut down, but uh, they come back in early August. Just a word about Pew, you know, he's a Quaker. And one of the values of Quakerism is, of course, peace and tolerance. But look at this. Talk about a fighting Quaker. Pew is saying, uh, you know, he basically loathes the Confederacy. He's, a, he's, a, he's certainly an opponent of slavery, but he hates them uh, equally for the dissolution of the Union. He's saying, I thank God that we now have a chance of killing men who I have long been satisfied never would be brought to reason in any other way. Had I not been here, I would leave my Quakerism at home until we could give those traitor scoundrels such a thundering thrashing as no people ever got before. Okay, well, Pew's now in Chester County. He's recovering. He's seeing a physician at the University of Pennsylvania. He entices a friend and colleague of his, George Caldwell, to come and teach his chemistry classes. In the meantime, there is a certain Dr. Thompson who is trying behind the scenes to convince the trustees to remove Pew from the presidency, but that fails. The trustees really have a lot of confidence in Pew. So he comes back in mid-October. Um, and as the fall continues, Pew is really, really pushing to get the college building finished. It's not quite done. And the students are about to go on winter break. Uh, Professor Caldwell leaves. He's drafted into the Sanitary Commission for the uh, United States. Uh, the vice president resigns. And now there are stirrings in the Pennsylvania legislature to rescind the college's land grant status and split it among other colleges. So at this point, in response to this attempt in the legislature, Pew writes a masterful plan for how to organize land grant institutions. And he's saying that uh, basically they have to be on a grand scale. Uh, we need larger institutions, higher standards and more faculty. And now the battle for the land grant bounty is about to resume, even though the act a year previous designated this institution as the sole recipient, now there's an effort to take it away. Um, the acceptance act 
1863 has this clause, an ominous clause, until otherwise ordered by the legislature, the annual interest will go to the Agricultural College of Pennsylvania. So we were basically construed as a placeholder as the legislature con uh, considers other ways of splitting up the money. Pew and Rebecca, she's recovered now. They managed to get married and they go on a honeymoon. But Pew is going to be called back to testify before the House Judiciary Committee. And he's saying, basically, the state should support a single industrial college and not split this up. It's not going to work. And agriculture, he says, and engineering education are complementary. They will work well together. He is saying that uh, we need a whole lot more money than we're getting now. And he's saying industrial colleges have to be research institutions. And he cites, he praises German universities. He's saying that Leipzig and Göttingen, where he had studied, each had 110 professors, not five or eight or 10. And he's saying the agricultural is, college is the only uh, public state-sponsored school in Pennsylvania, especially established for this fund and uh, governed by a board of trustees who are elected by delegates from all county agricultural societies. So Pew tells them, you're either going to give Pennsylvania one grand institution or you're going to transmit to them a number of petty institutions jealous of each other who will come up to the legislature year after year begging for money. In addition, Pew and the trustees decided to hold an open house. The college building was completed in the early spring of 1864. And uh, as you can see here, uh, a lot of the members of the legislature and state officials came. Um, the college really put on the dog. One student said, Dr. Pew told me he was afraid the dinner would cost more than the college would get out of it. He was quite right. Pew's efforts appear to be in vain. One bill, comes forth from the legislature designating six colleges and requiring them to advance the state 80 cents per acre uh, until the land could be sold off and be tuition free. How this makes any financial sense is beyond me. Another act basically says, we're going to uh, remove the agricultural college as the beneficiary. We're not gonna designate other institutions right away, but we're gonna take care of other business before we are able to do so. Who are the other institutions that this uh, legislation intended to benefit. Well, the Agricultural College of Pennsylvania was one of the six, but you can also see the others, Allegheny College in Meadville, the University at Lewisburg, now Bucknell, Pennsylvania College, now Gettysburg College, the Western University of Pennsylvania, Pitt, and the Polytechnic College of Pennsylvania, no longer in existence. Pew is livid. He writes a protest saying the effect of the bill is basically to squander the entire proceeds for all time to come of this magnificent grant of public land. And you can see here his writing. That word state is the last word he would ever write in his life. As he's writing this, he collapses at his desk in the chemistry lecture room. He manages to rally. He's overtaken by a violent chill. He presents what would become his last lecture. He's taken uh, to Willow Bank in Belfont where his wife is living. Uh, the college building is no fit place for a wife. And uh, as he leaves, he tells Alfred Smith that I am tired, my brain is tired, but I have a body that will stand everything. Meanwhile, uh, the legislature, the House takes up this Senate bill to remove the agricultural college as the beneficiary. Legislators are angry, saying uh, Pew is out of his mind. He's asking for money that is just uh, uh, way, way too much and uh, is indicative of the fact that uh, those people who are in charge of the institution don't know what they're doing. In any event, the college is saved by the bell. Time runs out of the legislation, out of the legislative session and the House votes to further uh, postpone the bill indefinitely. Meanwhile, Pew slips into delirium uh, and he dies a week later. His death is attributed to typhoid fever, overwork and stress and a weakened immune system from his broken arm. He did not live to see the final vote in the legislature, which preserved the college's land grant status for the time being. And there's the home in which he died, still there. His death shocks the nation's scientific and agricultural communities. The American Journal of Science and Art says, the Agricultural College of Pennsylvania, the first institution of its kind established in this country, was attaining a high degree of success and usefulness as a result of the rare combination of scientific and practical knowledge with administrative energy, which characterized 
It's lamented president. His death is a loss to Pennsylvania and to the nation. And is that it? The Pew aftermath, long story short, the Angerman status continues to be hotly contested. Finally, in February of 1867, the legislature awards the entire land grant fund to college. Uh, over the next 18 years, the college enters a, uh, an era of drift of strange transmutations under the next five presidents. And basically it abdicates its land grant mission and devolves into a backwoods classical college. And it is almost closed for good. In 1882, George Atherton comes here and long story short, he's a land grant college advocate and he over his 24 years of the presidency reconciles Penn State to its land grant mission, vastly expanding engineering. And so you see here Pew's major accomplishments and I won't go through them bit by bit, but his legacy uh, is basically that of Christopher Wren. If you seek his monument, look around you. Uh, the institution that he founded and made number one coming right out of the gates is now a top 100 global university. In fact, a uh, year before last ranked 43rd worldwide out of about 27,000 colleges and universities. And you can see that had his brilliant life been spared, we're confident by the force of his leadership that the great movement, which began in the 1880s for the promotion of agricultural chemistry and scientific agriculture would have been advanced by at least a decade. What a loss to Penn State. And that ends the story of Evan Pugh. Roger, thank you very much. We really appreciate that. Um, I know uh, I understand we had a little bit of a, a connection issue at one point, but we are back on. Uh, and um, as I said, uh, anyone who uh, has questions, We'll take a, a couple of questions right now. And if anyone else wants to uh, enter a question into the chat box on the screen, please feel free to do so. But I will, um, let, me, uh, let me pull up a couple uh, that we have already. Uh, so uh, Roger, let me ask you this one. The, um, if, uh, so you talked about the, the era of drift and the, the presidents that followed, immediately followed Evan Pugh. Um, uh, how do you think, uh, um, the early history of Penn State might be different if President Pugh had not died so young? Well, I think we would have uh, evolved more quickly into the institution we now are uh, much sooner, minus those 18 lost years, as it were. Uh, Pugh was a hard driver. He had hard and fast goals. He wanted to make this university the best in the country, and he did. It didn't last as long as we might have wished, but uh, there, 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 there's no question that uh, Penn State's evolution would have been hurried along much more quickly had he li lived. In fact, I would say by the turn of the 20th century, we, we may have been uh, in the top tier of American universities. Very good, thank you. Tracy and Renata, I have questions uh, that, that are similar uh, for each of you, but uh, Tracy, I'll start with you. Um, Years from now, do you think Outreach will still be offering virtual conferences, virtual internships, and even a virtual birding cup? So Rob, thanks for that question. Uh, so years from now, yes, I do think we will be offering them, but it won't be because we still have a pandemic, hopefully. Um, what I think is that we have learned to push the creative and innovative boundaries of our work. And so what we're planning to do is to offer face-to-face uh, -face programming again when it's safe to do so, but also offer programming in virtual and remote ways, as well as hybrid opportunities uh, in, for programs. Because you could see from my presentation that we have been able to reach audiences around the world uh, and enlarge our audiences and make some of our programming free and accessible in ways that otherwise we aren't able to do. So we will definitely leverage all that we have learned and the boundaries that we have pushed creatively and innovatively to be able to make ourselves more accessible and our content more relevant and accessible in a more timely way. Yep. And, and Renata, a, a similar question uh, came in for you. What, uh, what do you think might be the long-term impact of the pandemic on online education? Well, I think um, as, um, as I think many people are seeing, 
Uh, we are learning what works uh, really well. Um, we are also leveraging the strengths that we've had as an institution in this space. Uh, the long-term impacts, I think, are going to be uh, how well we respond as really in higher education uh, to thinking about um, the, the impact um, of a pandemic, um, having people learn remotely, uh, transitioning very quickly. What we've learned through there, we've learned uh, how some people are impacted disproportionately. So that means we have to think about how do we make things more equitable? Uh, we've learned about uh, what, it, what it means to actually engage learners, right? We always say education is really about engaging with content, engaging with a subject matter expert, the instructor, and engaging with your peers. And I think in every one of those places, we have learned um, significant things about what each of those aspects mean. And you can do this with a wide variety of modalities and a lot of mobility, but you have to focus on those learning outcomes. And I think that that has really driven us to sort of focus more on and sort of looking at some of those things, uh, the realities of those. Uh, so I think we've, we've learned through every step of it. Um, and I think we'll continue to learn. Absolutely. Uh, another question that, that I think probably uh, uh, relates to both of you in some way. So um, uh, how did you uh, coordinate with your teams when the, when the, um, when we closed the university and went to, to full online instruction. Um, how did you coordinate with your teams to ensure audiences and students were receiving the programming they needed while ensuring their safety and health? So I'm happy to jump in on that one first, Tracy, if you want me to. Um, so um, I, I will say one thing, uh, Rob, we never closed actually the university. Mm -hmm. uh, we did True. We did shift um, and obviously a lot of people shifted. We shifted, um, a lot of people work from home and are still working remotely. And of course the instruction shifted. Uh, so I would say um, what we did initially, and this is really from, from my perspective in terms of, of World Campus, I, we looked at it and I looked at it from two perspectives. One is the institution and the other is um, World Campus specific. Uh, and when I think about the institution, what we did there was we looked across the institution and we saw all of the tremendous resources that have been built up over time. Uh, and over time means really since World Campus was created, uh, but to look at all of those resources that have been, uh, been built and leverage those to help the institution, help the students, help the faculty, uh, help the staff in that uh, remote environment. Second thing is from World Campus standpoint, people might not have thought that anything changed for World Campus students, but it surely did. We were all living through a pandemic. We are still doing that. And while people's educational world campus students, their education might not have been impacted in the same way. What was impacted was their life around them. They might have been uh, a parent now that had to tend to their children who were now at home. They might have lost a position. There might have been other things that happened in their lives that actually put stress in their lives in a different way than, than what was before the pandemic. So one of the things we were responding to is what did our learners need? What did they need uh, in terms of support, emergency care, all sorts of things, and how could we help them continue to be on a path to be successful? In both cases, there was one thing that was true. We were always looking at the health and safety of our communities and always working toward the successful completion of that semester, that spring semester. And uh, I think across the institution, and certainly for World Campus students, uh, that's where our energies were placed. Tracy, did you want to add to that? Sure. So from an outreach perspective, uh, of course, first and foremost was the safety of our employees and our participants in programming. And we wanted to be able to follow all CDC, Penn State, and Commonwealth guidelines in the programming that we offered. Renata and I were uh, involved in 90-minute uh, meetings three days a week, starting at 7.30 in the morning from 7.30 to 9, where we were able to be advised by some of the best and brightest epidemiologists, public health experts, as they were advising uh, university leadership. And we were able to then take that knowledge and insight that we had and be able to go back to our teams. And in the case of outreach, we had weekly Zoom meetings where we brought the leadership team together, provided them with a briefing, and we were able to then think about what our strategy would be. 
And so uh, with the help of Pam Driftmeyer, who served on a university-wide committee, we were able to look across the entire portfolio and really charge people to start moving forward with how we would serve um, in this environment and what we would do following all the guidelines, but still finding ways to be relevant. And uh, we were able to do that, be relevant to our learners, be relevant to our university and um, serve in new ways, as you could see from the examples that I provided. But it took a lot of coordination, a lot of communication. And Rob, you know, because you were part of those, as I call them, Zoom stand-up meetings that we had uh, planned for every week in the early um, time of all of all of this. Absolutely. And Roger, we've got, uh, we've got one more for you. Uh, if uh, Evan Pugh could see outreach and online education today, would he recognize what he set out to create? Actually, I think he would, Rob. He was always on the cutting edge. He was ahead of his, <clears throat> excuse me, ahead of his time. And he had a strong sense of the service mission, the outreach mission that agriculture and mechanic arts colleges, land grant colleges uh, had to maintain and sustain and expand upon. I think he would be absolutely thrilled at uh, what Penn State uh, outreach and online education are doing today and what they have become and what they'll be doing in the future. I think he'd be entirely on board. I think he'd be amazed, but not surprised. That's a good way to end our, uh, our event tonight. Thank you, Roger. We appreciate your time. And Tracy and Renata, thank you for your, uh, your remarks and your, your uh, answers to your questions. Uh, and to all of you, thank you uh, for joining us this evening. We are very grateful for that. Uh, in November, our Year of Gratitude will continue with recognition of National Veterans and Military Families Month. You'll receive uh, the next Year of Gratitude email with a link to a special video featuring veteran and active duty military students and alumni from the World Campus. Until then, thank you for your support and your dedication to outreach and online education at Penn State. Stay safe and best wishes. Good night. Good night. Thank you.